Hello friends, welcome back to Dungeon Design in Zelda. For this series, we've already completed Varuta and Varudania. We are now halfway through reclaiming the four Divine Beasts. Following along with my preferred dungeon order, the next one will take us across to the western section of the map and up north to finally go after Va Meadow. As was the case with Varudania, from even the earliest moments of the game, the divine beast Va Meadow can be seen flying over the northwestern section of Hyrule, a massive, looming figure in the distance. I recall being absolutely fascinated by this before the game even came out during the E3 2016 demos. Seeing this huge flying machine out there was quite enticing. Since Meadow is so visible and out in the open, it isn't a stretch to say that it's likely to draw people in out of curiosity, which eventually will bring us to Rito Village. Now, it's worth a mention that out of the four Divine Beasts, Va Meadow has the least amount of mandatory pre-dungeon stuff to do. But while we're here, it is worth buying the Snow Quill armor set from the shop here in order to provide better cold resistance. This is the only place in the game where you can get this set. That means no freebies like with the Flamebreaker armor, and it will be pretty much essential while exploring Hyrule's colder regions. Just a quick mention about the music, as usual, Rito Village's theme is incredible. It's a new rendition of the fan-favorite Dragon Roost Island theme from Wind Waker. Rather than an upbeat, adventurous theme, this one is homey and melancholy. The way the track has this build up and then release before going into the Dragon Roost theme is just so evocative of that thoughtful, almost lonely feeling that is ever pervasive throughout this game. Honestly, I could go on and on about it, but really, above all else, it's just an amazing piece of music. It's calm, comforting, and just a touch morose all at once. And it's one of my favorite examples of this game's soundtrack taking old themes and putting a distinctly Breath of the Wild flavored spin on them. Here in Rito Village, we'll also meet Kennelli, the Rito Chief, whose name is almost certainly a reference to Komali, the Rito Prince from Wind Waker. Now, something worth a mention here is that according to creating a champion, the Rito are not very long-lived, implying that they have the shortest lifespans out of all the races in Hyrule. So while many Zora, including Sidon, were alive and well during the events of the Calamity 100 years ago, and recognized Link as, well, Link the Hylian Champion, for the Rito tribe, it's possible several generations have passed since that event. No Rito alive has first-hand knowledge of the events from 100 years ago. As such, there is a bit of confusion here with Kennelly about Link's identity as a champion, and the Rito Chieftain incorrectly deduces that Link here is merely a descendant of the Hylian Champion. He'll ask that we help out with the Divine Beast, which the Rito warriors have been battling. To start with, we'll have to find Teba, a prominent warrior among the tribe, who is preparing to attack Va Meadow alone. Teba's wife, Saki, will tell us that he took off to the flight range just outside the village. We can head over there and confront Teba. He'll understandably be skeptical when we tell him that we want to help him bring down Meadow, so he'll want to test us with a bit of archery practice. It's pretty simple though, you just have to shoot five targets within three minutes and you're done. Satisfied with your skill, he'll give you a handful 
handful of bomb arrows and give you a lift up so that we can take the fight to the Divine Beast. The attack on Va Meadow is pretty straightforward, and fairly similar to the attack on Va Ruta in a lot of ways. Tebo will give us a lift, and will also catch us if we fall down too low. Meadow will raise a force field around itself and shoot lasers at us through these cannons, so we can paraglide over, shoot the cannons with bomb arrows, rinse, repeat. As I mentioned already, this is the shortest lead up to boarding any of the Divine Beasts. The actual attack on Va Meadow is comparable to Ruta and Naboris, but there's very little questing or errands to be done beforehand. We don't have to gather ammunitions like we did with Va Ruta. Teba will just hand over some bomb arrows and be like, okay, let's go, after watching us shoot some targets. I like this scenario. Flying high above Hyrule like this and performing aerial combat is awesome. It feels really good to do, but considering how much running around we have to do before boarding the other Divine Beasts, it feels like something is missing here, like some section of the quest was left on the cutting room floor. I can't say what that may have been, just that this feels abrupt. It would have been great to be able to spend more time with Teba than we do too. It doesn't feel like we get to know him anywhere near as well as we do Sai on Riju or Yonobo, but alas, maybe that also plays into Teba's personality. He was already preparing to go face Meadow on his own when we showed up, and he doesn't care about being Link's friend as long as Link can help him get the job done. That's my best guess at least. Anyway, once all those cannons are destroyed, the force field will disperse, allowing us to board the Divine Beast and head inside. Welcome to Divine Beast of Va Meadow, named after Medley, the Rito Earth Sage from the era of the Great Sea. Meadow has a pretty distinct atmosphere. The beast remains afloat in the sky while we're exploring inside, and a fair amount of our traversal will be in exterior sections of the dungeon, giving this place a fairly grand sense of scope, as well as a perilous feeling since, you know, you don't want to fall off. What's interesting is that Va Meadow has a pretty expansive floor plan. This divine beast is enormous. The way it uses its space, however, is a bit of a mixed bag. For example, the second floor is this enormous space that takes up almost the entire rooftop, essentially making up Meadow's wingspan. It's huge, but it's also used only for this boss arena. So aside from these weird destructible pillars, it's pretty much just empty space. Inside, on the main floor, the rooms and puzzles are very densely packed together, and then there's these enormous gaps between rooms on the lowest floor, so even though the rooms are not huge, the feeling is larger because you have to glide through the open air. So we've got a bit of everything. Small, isolated pockets separated by large open space, mid-sized rooms that are filled with the bulk of things to do, and then one huge open area that is pretty much empty space. Sounds weird, but for what Va Meadow is, it actually kind of works for me. There's a good feeling of variety variety here in how the space is used. And if there is a sentiment that I've been repeating pretty often throughout this series of videos, it's that variety in level design is good. It keeps things interesting. Speaking of keeping things interesting, the dungeon manipulation gimmick this time around will allow us to tilt the Divine Beast at a 45 degree angle to either side. So much as was the case with Varudania, even though the concept is less mechanically complicated, its conceptual simplicity allows for more versatility in how it's used. In terms of how we move about the place as well as integration into puzzles, this ability to tilt the structure structure in almost its entirety is really well implemented. More so than the previous two, this Divine Beast has a very strong puzzle box feeling to it, and that tilt mechanic is integrated into every single one of those puzzles. In a way, Va Meadow actually strikes a healthy balance between Ruta and Rudania's approach to puzzles and traversal. Ruta's gimmick allowed us to move a spray of water to interact with a handful of mechanisms, such as these water wheels and flames 
flame pillars. Rudania had traversal and the change of floor plan from wall to floor as its main gimmick. Here, the tilting is worked into traversal the same as Rudania, but also has puzzles built around gravity and using these tilts to your advantage, much the same as how Ruta's puzzles were all built around directing that spray of water. So we have a mix here of those two design ideas, which is great to see. The traversal in Meadow is some of my favorite though in terms of how flexible it is. There are various updrafts to use, and open windows in certain areas allowing you to approach things from different places. For example, this room, which you can glide to from the bottom floor of the central room, but can just as easily be reached by jumping out this window in the room above it and gliding down carefully. This dungeon lets you really think outside the box and approach things however you want. This is probably the best so far in terms of how they've tapped into the potential of this open air gameplay style while designing a dungeon. It's just very fun to explore this place. The big drawback though, and this should surprise nobody if you've been keeping up with this series, is the lack of enemy presence again. Just like with Rudania, there's a total of one single guardian scout. Otherwise, there's only malice eyeballs and cursed style enemies, which can pretty well all be killed in a single strike. Why? The malice is integrated into a lot of the puzzles here as it obstructs various paths, which is kind of cool. But then why not add in more of these scouts or some other enemies? This would have been an amazing opportunity to include some classic flying Zelda enemies, like P-Hats, or aerial foes from Twilight Princess maybe? But alas, the story is the same here. One scout, a handful of eyeballs, and the boss, and that's it. As is the case with all the Divine Beasts, Va Meadow is a giant Sheikah construct, this time modeled after a large bird of prey. Now, I'm no bird expert, so I wasn't really able to discern what specific type of bird, but I'd like to think it's an eagle for poetic justice, since Rivali's weapon of choice is the Great Eagle Bow. That said, it could just as easily be a hawk or falcon or any other type of bird. The beak shape doesn't really match any birds of prey that I'm familiar with, but then again, I also don't know of any lizards that open their faces up the way that Vavrudania does either, so I'm sure there were simply some creative liberties taken by the Sheikah architects. I mentioned last time that Rudania had the most organic feeling of the four, but Meadow comes in a close second. In fact, much like the puzzles and manipulation gimmick here, I find it something of a middle ground between Ruta and Rudania. Ruta feels far more mechanical, with giant gears and mechanisms. Rudania leans more into the organic feeling, with giant rib and spine design built right into the ceiling. Meadow also has this same rib and spine-like design, but also has things like moving blocks, propellers and fans, and various other mechanisms present throughout. Nothing as hugely industrial feeling as those giant gears inside Ruta, but it's not absent like with Rudania either, so it falls somewhere in between. One of my favorite details is the windows on the bottom floor. The way they're designed, the window frames look like Meadow's rib cage, and I find it just very very visually striking. Another visually memorable feature about this particular Divine Beast is the collection of destructible pillars on the top floor. As far as I can tell, these serve no real purpose, and it's always confused me as to why they put these here. All of the Sheikah shrines and Divine Beasts have been made out of this particularly durable stone that has stood the test of time for about 10,000 years without much sign of wear and tear, except for these pillars. This is probably a weird nitpick, but they've just always felt out of place to me. I'm guessing that the boss arena just felt too empty without something here to break up the monotony of this huge flat surface on the roof. But whenever I see these, all I can think about is how Meadow is essentially a flying machine, and these would not be particularly aerodynamic. But perhaps I'm just being needlessly nitpicky with this one. It's unclear where in Hyrule Va Meadow was excavated, but if I had to guess, it would be somewhere in either the Hebra region or the Tabantha region. Around Lake Kilsey and Strock Lake seem like safe assumptions, but it could just as easily have been somewhere in the Tanagar Canyon, or pretty much anywhere else in the northwestern quadrant of Hyrule. It's hard to say, because there doesn't seem to be as clear a sign of any excavation operations around here, but they could have all fallen into disrepair or been buried by snow sometime over the last century. We simply don't know. 
The music of Va Meadow is one of my favorites. Like the other Divine Beasts, it builds upon itself as we make progress. When we first enter, we have this slow, thoughtful piece that is mostly piano-driven. The way those piano chords are hammered, sounding almost broken and off-key, gives this place an immediately chilling, almost haunted sound. And of course, I can't neglect to mention the Morse code signals, which are present in all the Divine Beasts themes. What's interesting about this one, however, is that it takes the longest to show up in Meadow's theme, but when it does, it's the most clear and obvious. The subtext here feels right at home knowing the personalities of the champions. It's no secret that Rivali has a pretty great sense of pride, and one could view this delayed call for help as the Rito champion not wanting to admit defeat until it's too late. The opposing SAD signal, which I mentioned last time, also doesn't seem to overlap with the SOS nearly as much, making that cry for help stand out even more. This could represent Rivali, who was a skilled warrior, holding out in battle, holding off the blight and its cry to search and destroy for longer than the other champions. Once we have the map and at least one terminal activated, the music kicks into gear with a persistent, rising string progression. The way the strings rise and fall like this just feels lofty, like a musical representation of the air circling these propellers and notes being carried in the wind. There's also a nice undertone of optimism in this track. It's not as bombastic as Rudania's, but it feels like the song goes from haunting to hopeful in a way. Maybe a musical parallel to the way Rivali starts to come around on his feelings towards Link. Remember, this guy viewed himself as something of Link's rival, but by the end of our time here, he genuinely seems willing to make amends with the Hylian Champion. Once all terminals are activated, the music evolves into this almost climactic piece. And I say almost climactic climactic because it feels like this part is musically pushing you forward, but never quite paying off, evoking the feeling of anticipation before the boss fight. It's great stuff. Alright, let's go over the progression. The boarding platform where we make our entrance is here, once again above the tail of the Divine Beast. Before we head inside, there is, again, an optional treasure chest directly behind us on Va Meadow's tail. We can then head inside, clear this malice, and we'll find ourselves in the central room. There's several movable blocks in here, which you can use to form a bridge, but you don't ever actually have to move them if you don't want to. You can just as easily hop across the gap and reach the Guidance Stone on the other side. With the map acquired, we'll now be tasked with activating five terminals spread out throughout the Divine Beast. As usual, we can do these in any order, but I'll cover them in the order that feels the most logical to me in terms of how and where we'll find them. Before we move on, there's one, two, three, three optional chests in this central room here. One on this ledge, one on the bottom floor, and one at the top of this climbable wall. Since there's a locked door in the right wing that can only be opened from the other side, I prefer to start by heading into the left wing first. Terminal number one can be found in this alcove here. We can clear the malice, then tilt Va Meadow, which should allow us to glide over to the alcove and activate the terminal. There's also another optional chest in here above this doorway. To get to the next terminal, there's a bit of a puzzle to do here. We'll find this funnel here that we can drop a bomb into. We'll need to tilt the Divine Beast so that the bomb rolls into the adjacent room on the other side of this barrier, then detonate the bomb to destroy these rocks. Now we'll want to strike this gem switch to open one of the windows in said adjacent room. Roll another bomb through, and the wind blowing in should roll the bomb towards this destructible wall. Blow it up, and a metal sphere will be revealed. You'll probably have noticed 
noticed a switch on the opposite wall here as well. We'll want to use the sphere to press it down. So line it up, tilt meadow, and let gravity do the work for you. This switch now opens the gate, so we can head into that adjacent room and activate terminal number two. Terminal number three is in a room directly below us. There's a number of ways to reach it, but I like to simply jump out this window and glide over to it. Easy peasy. That's three terminals done and pretty much everything on the left half of the dungeon. The remaining two are over on the opposite wing, so let's paraglide back to the central area and head over. On the lower floor, you'll see a small gondola held in place by Malice. Destroy the eyeball to free up the gondola, and then by tilting the Divine Beast, we can bring it over to us. Then ride it over to the room below this wing. Head up the ramp inside, and we can activate terminal number four. That aforementioned locked gate will now open, and we can do this little physics-based puzzle to reach the last terminal. We'll start by striking this gem switch and opening this window. There's two propeller switches, one is on this rail, a gate, a switch, and this heavy cylinder on this rail. Keeping both propeller switches moving in the wind will open the gate, allowing the cylinder to press down the switch. The tricky part is that tilting the Divine Beast to slide the cylinder over will also cause the second propeller to slide out of the wind, causing that gate to close and obstruct the cylinder. So you'll want to carefully hold it in place with Magnesis. Sounds easy enough, but if the cylinder doesn't hit the switch with enough force, it won't press in. So don't be too surprised if you have to back things up and try it a couple of times. With that done, this gate should open and we can activate the last terminal. Just a quick side note, there's just a couple more optional treasure chests. One dropped by this Malice eyeball on the ceiling, and another on this ledge right here. Most of the optional chests haven't been particularly useful in all honesty, but at least this one should give you a decent bow, which you'll want for the upcoming boss fight. All that's left now is the central control unit, which is on the rooftop here. And just as you'd expect, when we attempt to activate it, we'll be confronted by the dungeon boss. From the main control unit, Malice will flood out and form Wind Blight Ganon, the scourge that defeated Rivali and commandeered Va Meadow a century ago. Wind Blight continues with the same visual design as the other Blights, having a horrible mix of Sheikah technology and Malice, topped off with Ganon's head of flaming red hair. Though what separates Wind Blight from the previous two is that instead of an ancient sword or spear, Wind Blight opts for a giant arm cannon. This guy clearly took notes from either Samus or Meg. Mega Man or something. Much like the level design at large here, Wind Blight also feels like something of a middle ground between Water and Fire Blight Ganon, you know, minus the melee weapons. He's not as scrawny and creepy, or as bulky and intimidating as either of them, falling somewhere in the middle. But he is still pretty big compared to little old Link here. The giant laser gun is pretty cool and all, but unfortunately, Wind Blight doesn't do too much that's interesting with it. He is able to launch launch tornadoes at you and obviously shoot lasers, but that's about it. He also doesn't do too much to shake things up when it comes time for the second phase of the battle either. Water Blight flooded the arena, reducing the amount of space within which you have to operate. Fire Blight deployed his massive shield to increase his defenses. Wind Blight, on the other hand, releases these little ricochet drone thingies and bounces his laser between them. Unfortunately, it's very easy to avoid all of these attacks if you keep moving. Wind Blight may have a giant laser cannon, but he he doesn't have the best aim. Heck, if you get close enough to him, he'll just aim right past you. Come on, Wind Boy, you're better than that. Wind Blight also spends a great deal of time flying up in the air, but there's a couple of these large fans allowing you to circumvent the only advantage that he has by floating up there and using bullet time to get in some headshots with your bow. In fact, that is really the crux of this fight. If you're good at landing headshots with your bow, then Wind Blight will go down 
down very easily, and you'll spend more time waiting for him to finish teleporting around the arena than you will actually fighting him. Now, I'll say that my opinion on this matter might be somewhat skewed. I have live streamed this game a lot over the past few years, and I've been repeatedly told by viewers that I have very good aim. So if you're not as accurate with a bow, you might have a harder time here than I did. That said, I still feel like the ease at which you can get into bullet time and unleash a barrage of headshots undermines the difficulty of this fight, especially if you have that quick shot falcon bow that Teba gives you before your attack on the Divine Beast. That particular bow allows you to shoot farther, faster, and straighter than most other bows, meaning that even when he's keeping his distance from you, you're still able to land headshot after headshot and just drain his health. These little ricochet drone things are probably the most dangerous thing about this fight, since he'll unleash a heavy concentration of attacks and bounce them around. But even those can be destroyed with a well-placed arrow, so there's still not much risk here. To sum it up, Wind Blight just doesn't do much. He floats around, he wastes time teleporting excessively, which is more of a nuisance than anything, especially on Master Mode when his health will regenerate, but he's extremely open and vulnerable to attack, so you're able to just spam headshots and take him down. I really feel like this is the least interesting of the four Blight battles. Which is too bad, because just looking at his design and that huge laser gun, I feel like there was some untapped potential here. Once he's defeated, we'll get our heart container as usual, activate the central control unit, and Rivali's spirit will appear. After a bit of snarky dialogue, he'll reward us with Rivali's Gale, which may be the most useful of the four champion abilities, since it allows allows us to ride an updraft into the air, which seriously bolsters our maneuverability, especially considering just how many mountains there are to climb around Hyrule. With the Divine Beast Va Meadow under the control of its champion, it can take position above Rito Village, taking aim in preparation for our upcoming battle against Calamity Ganon. So that's the dungeon. Overall, Va Meadow does a lot of cool stuff. It has a strong focus on physics-based puzzles as well as traversal. Our mobility in this dungeon is super herbly flexible in the best way. I adore how the manipulation gimmick is integrated so well into both the puzzles and how we explore this place. It's fantastic. But oh boy, is there some room for improvement. I'm sure I'm sounding like a broken record at this point, but the lack of enemy presence is very noticeable here. You fight that one guardian scout at the beginning, and then the whole place just feels so empty after that. This could have been a great place for flying enemies to show up, or enemies that push you back with either strong attacks or with wind-based attacks. Adding those would increase the risk of, well, falling right off the place. Just imagine this for a moment. In Wind Waker, when you're approaching the Forbidden Woods, we need to glide between these updrafts from one island to the next, all while these P-hats are gunning for you, so you have to carefully avoid them while navigating. Now imagine that while we're gliding along the wingspan of the Divine Beast. Rather than just a big empty space, we'd have some element of danger here. Between that lack of danger and how vulnerable Wind Blight Ganon is to attacks from your bow, it seriously makes me wonder how an archer as talented as Rivali lost in battle here. Sorry. I know some people don't like this character, but you can't deny he is extremely proficient with his bow, which is the weapon that Wind Blight is most vulnerable to. Aside from that usual complaint though, Va Meadow does some what make up for this with an even stronger puzzle focus than the last two dungeons, and a gimmick that feels more meaningful to our progression here. I do miss the combat, but I love exploring this place and solving these puzzles. It's fun just to move around in here. So it's a mixed bag, an underwhelming boss fight and nearly no enemies, but also some really fun stuff to do, and an awesome lofty atmosphere. Overall, despite those criticisms, I really do enjoy my time exploring Exploring Va Meadow. 
Thank you so much for watching this video. Before we end this off, I just wanted to take a moment to say thank you to my patrons and channel members, including, but not limited to, Grey Mage, Brenda, Tetra, Callie, Ethan3G, Gail, Hylian Wes, Justin, Clifford Longhead, Midnight Naomi, and Bunny. Thank you all so much for the support and for watching, and I will catch you all next time. Bye-bye.